noticed this or not, um, but there seems to me to be a trend in, in Hollywood and the movies to sort of choose to tell a story over the course of three or four separate sort of individual movies. And the whole idea of a trilogy is, of course, nothing new. The Star Wars, we all know the Star Wars trilogy. They made a trilogy back when I was a kid. Then they made a trilogy like 10 years ago, and now they're in the midst of a third trilogy. They're, they're a trilogy of trilogies, I guess, um, when you think about it. Um, and so this, this approach isn't new, but it does seem to be increasing in popularity. And sometimes it, it seems to make perfect sense. I get why they do it that way. And other times it just seems like it's a ploy to get me to pay three times to see a, a movie. Um, but this only becomes a problem if you go to see a movie and you're not aware that it is just one portion of a three-part series. Um, I, I didn't grow up reading the Lord of the Rings movies, those are uh, books, those were familiar to me. Um, and so when those movies came out, I went with my family, my brothers and some friends and, and we went and saw the very first Lord of the Ring movies. And I don't know if you remember how that movie ends, but Frodo is getting into a canoe and he's paddling away after this epic battle and sort of Mordor is off in the distance and, and he's on his way and then the credits come up. And I, I like looked at my brother and I said, that's the stupidest end to a movie I've ever seen in my life. He's like, there's two more coming. You know, I was like, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> and, and, and for years, I think I have uh, sort of grown, I grew up in the church. So I, I grew up around this and I kind of viewed the Bible in, in a similar way. I sort of understood it as this collection of loosely connected stories that are teaching us valuable lessons, but somehow I failed to see it as this cohesive narrative that God has been writing from creation in, in Genesis to completion in the book of Revelation. That's one of the things I love about our, our True series that we use in our children's ministry program, if you're familiar with that, and some places in our student ministries program. It, as it teaches these stories, it roots them in God's overall, uh, what it calls the big God story, the whole story of of scripture. I think that it's great that our kids are getting that. So my understanding of the Bible really, and in particular I would say of the Old Testament, began to change when I began to understand story as a comprehensive, or scripture as a comprehensive story of God's plan of, of redemption, of, of his love for us and the degree that he was willing to go in order to demonstrate that love. The whole thing from, from beginning to end is a comprehensive love story. And like every good story, there is a climactic moment, um, a point in time where all of the storylines sort of come together and in the midst of that there is either victory or there is defeat. And now, as we've been studying the story of Jesus, and in many ways, I think the, the entire story of all of Scripture, we come to this moment in this final week of the life of Christ. Um, from the events leading up to His triumphal entry, um, ultimately then to His resurrection. This is what we have been in the midst of in our current series entitled, Behold the Man. Those famous words of Pilate as Jesus is standing before him at his trial. In our focus this evening, in our time together here, I want us to look at Jesus' celebration of Passover with his disciples in the upper room, what we commonly refer to as the Last Supper. And for me, this moment, the words here that Jesus shares with his disciples I think this captures so much of this climatic moment. This is sort of the beginning of, of what is going to ultimately be accomplished through Jesus on the cross. Where all these storylines are now coming together and they find their final resolution in the person of Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles with us, we're going to turn to, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 22. We're going to look at Luke's account of the Last Supper together. We're going to begin in verse 7 
and go from there. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent John and Peter, saying, Go, prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you've entered a city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And when they went and found it just as he has told them, they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given, it, when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the covenant is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who is going to do this. Let's pause there for a moment. There are a variety of ways I think that we could that we could approach this text and work our way through it. But for our time here today, I want, us, I want us to look at this from the perspective of the past, the present, and the future. So let's consider this from the perspective of the past. Jesus here, as He is gathering with His disciples, along with all of Israel, has now come together for the celebration of Passover. It's important here as we think about the context of what is taking place and all that Jesus is doing, to understand that Jesus is now linking Himself with all that is about to unfold in the next couple of days with this celebration of Passover and ultimately with Israel's covenant relationship with Yahweh. Our understanding of this passage then subsequently must stem from our understanding of the significance and the history around Passover. Um, the, the celebration of Passover in the Jewish culture is a remembrance of, of deliverance and of redemption. Passover is of central importance in their faith. Um, for many of you, this may be uh, a, a reminder. Uh, for others, perhaps this is new information. But either way, I think it, it's worth repeating. Passover was, was where the Jewish people remembered and celebrated God's deliverance of Israel from captivity in Egypt. Moses now is going before Pharaoh and he's asking for the release of, of the Jewish people and Pharaoh's heart continues to harden. And as, as Pharaoh hears Moses' instructions, he continues to refuse to obey. Egypt now has already suffered through a series of escalating plagues. And as Moses continues to, to make his case in front of Pharaoh, Pharaoh continues to refuse. Now in Exodus chapter 11, Moses uh, now warns that there will be one final and devastating plague in Egypt. Where the firstborn son in every home from Pharaoh's great palace to the most humble servant's quarter would die. There was just one exception. There would be a, a Passover of judgment for every home that was covered in the blood of a sacrificial lamb. The Passover lamb. Moses now instructs the people of Israel to prepare themselves. They would take a lamb without blemish and sacrifice it on behalf of their entire household. The blood of the lamb was to be wiped across the doorposts of their home, identifying them as God's people. 
that they had followed the Lord's instructions and that they were consecrated unto Him. In Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, it says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So, so God gives Israel these very clear instructions and just as He said it would happen, it happened. And as all of this is taking place in the midst of it now, God instructs His people to set aside this day for memorial. To remember how God had delivered His people, Israel, from the oppression of the Egyptians. Every year then, the people would gather to celebrate Passover, to remember. And there would be three critical elements as a part of this celebration. There actually are more than that. Um, there's, There's bitter herbs to remind them of the affliction that they suffered. There was There was salt water to represent tears of captivity. But at the heart of it, there's three critical elements. First, there is the unleavened bread. The bread that was made in haste by the people of Israel as they rushed to depart from Egypt. Additionally, the removal of the leaven in the bread was a sort of a symbolic leaving behind of, of the gods of Egypt. Jesus Himself would use this same example of, of leaven to represent false teaching and, and hypocrisy. Those things that, that sort of work their way through an entire community. The unleavened bread would, would remind Israel that they were redeemed. That they've been restored once again as the people of God. And then there was the wine. The wine during the Passover meal was shared in four cups, each reminding the Jewish people of a promise that God had made from Exodus chapter 6. The promise of deliverance. The promise of freedom. The promise of redemption. And ultimately, the promise of consummation, of completion, where He says, you will be My people. And I will be your God. God was faithful to fulfill His promises. The people of Israel recall these promises both as a source of hope and and also to celebrate God's faithfulness to them. But then there was this third essential element of every Passover meal. And that was the Passover lamb. No Passover meal would be complete without the lamb, the tangible reminder of the sacrifice that was offered for the salvation of people. It was the blood of the lamb that allowed them to be spared the same fate that fell on every single home throughout all of Egypt that night. If your doorpost was not covered in the blood of the lamb, then you were not spared. On that night in Egypt, every home had one of two things. You either had a dead lamb or a dead son. Israel recalls this each year at Passover. The lamb would remind them of this this substitutionary sacrifice that they had received. So all of this then is the context that Jesus is speaking into as we enter into here in Luke chapter 22. Jesus has gathered together with His disciples to celebrate Passover. He's given very specific instructions to to Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal so that we may eat it. I think as they entered into this time together, this Passover meal would have been like every meal, every Passover that they had ever celebrated. All of the elements were there. And yet at the same time, this would be entirely unique. Unlike anything that they had ever experienced. With this background in mind, now let's consider this passage from the perspective of the present. And by that, I'm not referring to our current present, but the present that is unfolding in this moment as Jesus gathers with His disciples in the upper room. 
with all of the necessary elements for the celebration of Passover there. And what takes place in the midst of all of this is incredible. Because this story now that God has been writing, the promises that God has been making to His people, all of it, it all will find its completion now in the person of Jesus Christ. In this celebration of Passover now, Jesus is going to make a connection between all that has been with all that is about to unfold in the next couple of days and at the very center of it is another substitution. A salvation that comes through the blood of innocence. And this time through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Back in Luke chapter 22, Jesus is sitting with His disciples in verse 14. And it says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table with the apostles and he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. me." And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The text here says in verse 14 that Jesus has earnestly desired to celebrate this Passover meal with his disciples. This expression here is a Semitic expression indicating great emotion, this earnest desire, a sense of of urgency or importance. Jesus understands all that is happening, all that will transpire in the next uh, 48 hours, and He needs this time with His disciples to help them understand it, to help prepare them for them to see the significance of all that's going to happen. All of the history of the people of God has been moving now towards this moment. And Jesus is going to help them understand this through the celebration of Passover. Jesus here in this scene would be presiding over Passover with His disciples. Typically in the home, the patriarch of the family, or in this case, the, Jesus as a rabbi with His followers would guide everyone through the Passover meal explaining the various elements, reminding them of the promises, recalling the captivity in Egypt and God's ultimate deliverance. But now Jesus here changes the script. Instead of pointing His disciples backwards towards Israel's redemption from Egypt, He now points them forward to the ultimate redemption that He will provide. Scripture says that that He took the cup and He gives thanks And he instructs his disciples that he says, take this and divide it among yourselves. But then he says something very curious and I think very important. He says, I will not drink of the fruit of this cup, of this vine, until the kingdom of God comes. Remember the significance of the cups here in Passover were to recall a promise. The promises of God from Exodus chapter 6. The fourth promise of which was the promise of consummation, of, of completion. It's where you will be my people and I will be your God. Jesus now has in mind the fulfillment of this promise. The ushering in of the kingdom of God through His ultimate death and resurrection. In their rich history, the Passover was intended to celebrate the completion of a promise, but now Jesus is looking, He's longing for the final completion, the ultimate completion of of that promise. A completion that is once and for all. He's pointing His disciples not backwards, but rather forwards towards towards a sacrifice, towards a, a completion that will be done on their behalf, on behalf of all of us, wherein He will be our God and we can be His people where we can live in relationship with Him. There is a A second cup here mentioned in Luke's account of the Last Supper. Jesus says in verse 20, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. 
Jesus is now, he is now ushering in a new promise, a new provision for redemption, a new salvation. And this time, this provision would not come through the blood of a Passover lamb, but rather through the blood of the very Son of God. Additionally, now Jesus takes the bread and he offers it to his disciples, but instead of referring to the bread of, of uh, the unleavened bread made in haste instead of referring to the, the bread of affliction that their forefathers ate in the wilderness, Jesus says, this, this is My body which is given for you. In John chapter 6, Jesus is teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. And He says in that moment, He says, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. Now Jesus is making the connection between that which they have known their whole lives through the celebration of Passover. And he's saying this is no longer about a deliverance from Egypt. This is a greater deliverance. This is about a greater freedom. A freedom from sin and death and it would ultimately be completed through Jesus. Jesus is now pointing His disciples towards this climactic moment in all of redemptive history. And Jesus accomplished it through the giving of His body. When I was growing up, I grew up, I told you I grew up in the church. I grew up in a, a denomination, um, a brethren denomination, which there aren't a lot of that around here. But in our church, we would celebrate communion about twice a year. And it was kind of a whole big ordeal. There was um, actually feet washing was a part of it. And, and a, a Passover, not a Passover meal, but what we called a love feast. It was a meal included with it. And we, people would gather together and make actual unleavened bread and, and all of this. And so when I was a child, before you were at an age to understand what was taking place, they would set up chairs along the side of the room. And the whole thing typically took a couple of hours. So as a kid, I would sit in this small chair on the side of the room and I would watch all of this unfold. I would watch my parents. I would listen to uh, one of our pastors talk about the elements and what was happening. And, and over the course of time, I began to understand it more and more. And yet, to me, it was always something where I was kind of like, I, I get it, but I don't, I don't get it. You know, I couldn't fully understand it at that time of life. And I, I, as I think about this, I got to think this is where the disciples are at in this moment. I mean, Jesus is connecting this to something they know intrinsically, something that they have understood their entire lives, and yet He's talking in such a way, there's a fulfillment here that they can't yet understand, that they have failed to grasp. Jesus here in this text, or in actually any account of the Last Supper, there is no mention of the Passover lamb, which is interesting because the lamb was the point. It was the blood of the Lamb that allowed the angel of death to spare Israel the judgment that God was going to bring on Egypt. Jesus here is now offering Himself as the Passover Lamb. He's offering Himself as the sacrifice that removes judgment. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist would refer to Jesus as the Lamb of God. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 5 would use this same symbolism saying, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Peter would refer to the church as having been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You see, this is absolutely critical to our understanding of what's transpiring here because it's all about the blood. Because judgment will pass over those who have been covered by the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ. God Himself here in the person of Jesus Christ will now offer His body and His blood as an atonement for my sin. Here's what Jesus is saying with His disciples in that upper room. He's saying, I am the Lamb. This is substitutionary atonement. The Son of God taking my place. And consequently then, Jesus is essentially saying, this is the only way. 
Everything that's happening here, everything that Jesus says to his disciples in the upper room, everything that takes place on the cross ultimately eliminates any notion that we can have that this is one way among many. For God here to offer himself as a sacrifice when other options are available to him, that's not an act of love. That would be an act of insanity. You see, this is absolutely unique among all world religions because the ability, my ability to be in a relationship with God isn't based on the covenant that I make with Him. Through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, I can have a saving relationship with God the Father because God made a covenant with me on behalf of me. And there's nothing else like this. Lastly, then, let us consider this from the perspective of the future, perhaps put differently from uh, what does this mean to us? How is this relevant to us? There are a few observations here, some, some implications in this text I think are important for us to understand. First are just these two little words implanted in verse 19, where Jesus is talking about the bread and he said this, is my body which is given for you. For you. Jesus is obviously talking to His disciples here, but He is speaking directly to us as well. The preposition that is used here in the Greek carries with it a sense of vicariousness. Done on behalf of. In place of someone else. We cannot miss the reality that we are the recipients, that we are the benefactors of this sacrifice. Jesus says to us, this is for you. We cannot, we must not miss this. Hear me now. The single greatest act of love ever accomplished in all of human history, according to Luke chapter 22, Jesus says that was for you. The power of these words is so significant that we can scarcely take it in. And if you are hearing this for the very first time, if all of this is new to you, it is my earnest prayer today that you would understand that what Jesus accomplished on the cross, He specifically said, this is for you. This was done for you. You see, the substitution that took place wasn't on behalf of of another Passover lamb. It was on behalf of me. It took my place. He took my place. My guilt. My sin. And He bore it on the cross and He did the same for you. And if you are here and you have known this, you have understood this, you've already received this, then I pray that that you and I would live in full awareness of this reality because I think that understanding this changes the way we live. That we would not go to the table for communion out of a sense of obligation or going through the motions, but rather as an act of worship. A response to the degree to which we are loved and a reminder of which that love cost. I think this, this changes the way we live. Jesus here additionally, He says to His disciples, Do this in remembrance of me. This is the only command in the New Testament where Jesus specifically tells us to repeat a celebration. There's no command to to celebrate repeatedly Easter. There's no command to celebrate Christmas. Those are born out of our history in the church. But Jesus tells us to do this in remembrance of Him. God, as, as He is taking the people out of Egypt, He gives them these very specific instructions because because He knows that they will need to remember the Passover as He freed them. It's not for His benefit, but rather for the benefit of His people. And now He does the same for us. Do this in remembrance of Me because He knows that our tendency will be to drift further and further away from our understanding that this sacrifice is for us. Where we begin to depend on our own efforts and we begin to depend on our own righteousness for for our uh, accountability, for our case before God. 
So he brings us to the table so that we will remember that there was a blood sacrifice made for the forgiveness of sins. For our sins. I think this is, just, this is another incredible example of God knowing what we need and then providing for that need. Lastly, and I will wrap up with this, in the book of Hebrews, the author is writing to a very specific Jewish audience and he's, he's making the case that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of their faith. That, that in the ways that He is superior to everything that they have clung to throughout their history. He makes the case that Jesus is superior to the angels. That He is greater than, than the Mosaic Law, than Moses Himself. He makes the case that Jesus is a superior high priest in ultimately a superior covenant. In Hebrews chapter 10, then he gets to the point where he says Jesus is the superior sacrifice. The one given once and for all for the forgiveness of sins. This is Hebrews 10, verses 10 through 12. And it says, By that will, referring to the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every high priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. In verse 14, it says, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The author of Hebrews is simply pointing out Jesus is great, he's the ultimate sacrifice made for us in a moment i'm going to pray for us and we are going to conclude this evening by responding in communion by coming to the table Um, and as i pray i'll conclude and then i'll give you just a few short instructions and we'll take in we'll respond to what we've heard tonight by coming to the table would you pray with me Father, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to be together in worship, to be, to be reminded, Lord, even of, of the significance, the, the atonement that was provided for us through your substitutionary sacrifice. That you took my guilt, my sin, my shame, and you bore it on the cross so that I could live redeemed with you. Lord, as we come to the table, Allow us to celebrate, to remember that great love that was given for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.